Hi, and uh, welcome to another Hopper on Microcontrollers video. Um, if you've been following the Hopper story for a while, you'll be familiar with this project. Um, it's my overkill driveway uh, sunset light switches. So the driveway lights come on with sunset and obviously the sunset and for about two hours. Uh, and obviously sunset changes throughout the year. Um, so initially, um, I've got this project up on Hackster. I'll put the link in the description below. Initially, I built this um, based on a little uh, Wemos D1 Mini microcontroller. Um, it had a little early display so that you could see what was going on. And it had a microphone that you tap on the box to turn on the display because I didn't want to leave the display on all the time. Um, it would connect um, to the internet and using web services to get the time and to get the sunset. So two different web APIs to get the time and the sunset. Um, and this is written in good old um, Arduino C, C++. And it's an overkill solution because I'm not really trying to make a light switch. I'm trying to make um, reliable computing on microcontrollers, stuff that runs forever. Um, so it really annoys me when, um, you know, tech support says, okay, have you tried turning the power off and on again? Or when you get an update on something and it just stops working after you update or they change something, it makes it stop working. Anyway, this is the first version of the project. Um, and it didn't work very well at all. And it's, I, I traced it to keeping track of um, stack and heap in the Arduino environment. And it's usually third party libraries that are responsible, like the thing for, you know, a JSON library or, a, um, or actual web calls. And over time, they just uh, lose resources until the thing eventually dies. So it's just really sloppy coding in the part of um, on the part of anything in a third party library that makes significant use of strings. And I, you know, the Arduino string class might be responsible itself. So this is what we got, got me going on the whole hopper um, bandwagon, because I figured um, I'm going to do a better job of writing a development environment that um, where you can run forever, and you don't have to, you know, power cycle or update or any of that. Um, anyway, the second iteration um, looks very much like the one, the third iteration that I'm going to show today. But the second iteration did the same thing, but with Hopper. Um, so the microcontroller I used before, you can fetch it quickly. Um, the, the microcontroller I used before was this one here, um, the Challenger, and it's a great little board. Um, this is the RP2040 one. They've got an RP2350 version now as well. So that little bar on the right-hand side is actually the Wi-Fi antenna. So this has Wi-Fi, um, which means it could connect to the internet in the house, and it could call those two uh, time services, one to get the current time and one to get sunset and sunrise times, or just sunset time. Um, and that worked pretty well. So it's this version of it has an um, an Adafruit e-ink display, um, you know, by color black and red, um, which is kind of nice because you don't have to worry about tapping on the box to make the display because when the the display stays, um, it's very very low power. It only chews power and does things when you change what's on the display. If you turn the power off, it it keeps it. I've got uh, videos on e-ink paper and they're, they're really nice. They take take a little while to update to refresh, like a couple of seconds to refresh. But for this purpose, it's the perfect display because it's just like a piece of paper. So the microcontroller used to be um, this one behind here, which I've now swapped out for a different one and had this large relay because I'm driving uh, quite a few amps through those all those lights. So large relay for the lights. Um, the e-ink display is behind there. So that's what it had before. It had a uh, relay, a challenger board, the Wi-Fi board and the e-ink display. I've changed it now. Um, why did I change it? Well, the longest this ran for without failure was about eight months, which is not bad. Um, but the reason for failure, and then it failed uh, more than once in a month. And the first reason for failure was that the web service I was using for the time um, 
ceased to function, you know, one of these free public services, or it became unreliable. Um, and that would cause it. So if there was a power cycle, it would, you know, if there was a power failure in the neighborhood or something, uh, and it would have to get the time again, um, the time would be, it would fail on that service. And then the time would be wrong until it tried again. Um, so that was the one thing is relying on third party web services, basically anything outside your control, um, is going to fail. Then the next time, so, so then I changed it to just using there's like a generic page on the Arduino.com website or whatever it is. Um, that's just a text page. And I just used the HTTP headers to get the time, which was much more reliable than using some um, JSON based web service, which is going to fail eventually because they change their minds about how it works and they deprecate it. So any external thing is going to fail. But the Arduino text page has been there for two decades and hasn't changed. So I, I switched to using HTTP header dates, which gives you, you know, um, UCT for, um, uh, you, you know, anyway, it's, it's a good way of getting it. But of, of course, um, means I had to do a little bit more work for daylight savings. And I had to make up a table of sunset times. And I, I did that. And that worked fine. And then the next thing it failed was I've got a Starlink, Starlink internet connection here. And the next time it failed, the first thing I try um, power cycling is not the device. I try power cycling, you know, whatever's providing the internet connection because the diagnostics on the little screen told me that it failed to connect to the internet after some power failure event. And then I found that um, it was actually, if I power cycled Starlink, it would work again which, you know, made me even more annoyed about third party stuff. Like why did the internet connection fail after a power cycle? Why couldn't it reconnect? Um, so I decided, okay, a super reliable version is not going to be using the internet for anything. And I'd been working over the last couple of months on a whole bunch of different real time clocks um, for other, other purposes. So the coolest one I came up with was this one, which, which I built to, um, to plug into the Hopper 6502 single board computer via the I squared C bus. Um, so that's, you know, the simplest real time clock. It's just this little chip and that little crystal. That's it. And obviously it has a battery for battery backup. But I, you know, I've done a lot of work on real time clocks um, in the last couple of months. So I've supported a lot of them. So I swapped out the microcontroller for one that doesn't have Wi Fi. Don't need that. And I added a real time clock to it. And these are all Adafruit products. So that's the board behind there is one. It's the first RP2350 board that they released. It's got an HSTX 22 pin port on it, um, which you can use for video, but I don't need. Um, and then I just want their simplest Ada logger, which is the one of the older real time clocks they have. Um, and it also can take an SD card for data logging, which I might use um, at some point um because the driver exists in hopper so that i can you know log history with it because the whole point of this device is to see how long it'll run for um without intervention like can we make reliable computing with microcontrollers and the whole point of the hopper language is that it's a managed environment like c sharp or java so you should not have to worry about memory management you just write string code and do whatever you like and it should just continue to function forever so as part of the logging this time um, let's see what it's going to look like. So that's the current display. Um, it's got two times on there. Um, it's got the, the reset time, which is when it was uh, last, when the real time clock was last set. And that happens when it's plugged into the debugger. Uh, it's an automatic feature of Hopper. If you've got a real time clock on your, on your app, it'll, uh, update the, you can update the date and time to your debugger's date and time, your Windows computer's debugger. And on the right is power cycle. So the last time it was power cycled. Um, and we're going to see how long this can run for without intervention. Like how many months can I, can this thing run for without needing, without me needing to open this box again and see if we've actually created a reliable system uh, with Hopper. So let's go have a look at the code. Um, so here we go. Um, it's convoluted, uh, deliberately. Uh, so 
I'll just walk through here from, let me go look at the main program first, and I'll come to look at the functions. Let's have a look. So the main program, how does it work? So the main hopper program. Um, I use the built-in NeoPixel for diagnostics. I've got a relay pin, set it uh, you know, to output, switch off the relay, that turns the light off when you start. Update LEDs is just a way of quickly updating the RGB LED to mean different things. Um, this is this little section has an artifact when I was trying to connect to the internet um, because it would hang if it failed um, inside the you know Arduino library that's connected to the internet. So not a hopper problem. So I just looped through here, you know, five seconds so that if you rebooted it, you could actually break in with the debugger and it would flash um, the uh, built-in LED to tell you it was in this mode. Um, I could probably get rid of that. It doesn't not need it anymore. Initialize times is to initialize my, if I right click on this, it should go to the definition, loading definitions, initialize my sunset time. So I've got an array um, of a good, you know, good set of values for sunset in Nelson, New Zealand, which is where I am. Um, I've also got good defaults um, for the for the day of the year when daylight saving starts and when day, daylight savings ends because these are in sort of um, you know these times for sunset and, uh, on and off are the same time you're going to see on your watch. In other words, it compensated for daylight savings time, so that means I have to put some daylight savings code in. And I made it. It's deliberately complicated because I want to see if we can make a reasonably complex um, hopper program that just keeps running forever without um, failing. Um, initialize the real-time device, the real-time clock, and then this initialize real-time clock is to set the, t set the time. So let's go have a look how that works. If we're currently running in the debugger, it'll set the time using the time on your Windows machine. So from the debugger, it'll set the time. Um, if not, it, this'll do nothing. Um, but I'm so so here I set the time and then I get what the current time was. Um, then I have to do this um, monkeying to make sure that the time stored in the real time clock is not um, daylight savings time because the time I get from the debugger is the time on my computer as you see it on the clock, which is including daylight savings time. So I can figure out if it's daylight savings time with these little helper functions, you know what, um, uh, uh, using those figures I came up with for Nelson. So get the, from the date, get me the current day of the year, from the current date of the day of the year, figure out if it's daylight savings or not. If that is set to true daylight savings. Um, if we're currently on daylight savings, try and normalize the time. So basically subtract an hour, uh, and then store it back in the real time, because you can manually set the time in the real time clock as well. So we'll manually adjust it by an hour and make a note um, of which when it was that we reset the date or, uh, that we reset the, t um, the, the time in the in the real time clock from the debugger and i write that date into a file called rtc so just in the root folder of the it's, it's, hopper has a file system in the microcontroller in the flash by default so it's going to write that date into the file and save it there and why are we writing this date into the file well if we power cycled, but we weren't connected to the debugger, in other words, when I plug it in in the garage, wherever it is, then it's going to read that time from that same file. And that's the date. So it's keeping track of which, what date did we set the real time clock from the debugger. And then the second date I'm keeping is the date of the last, last power cycle, which would be either when it's plugged into the debugger or when it's not. So it'll keep those two dates. And if you look on the display here, um, those are those two dates there. The date we last reset the um, uh, the real time clock um, using using the debugger, and the date of the last power cycle. And this is going to give us an idea of how many months we've been running for uh, without a failure. Right. Uh, let's go back where we were. So I, I control backspace to jump back to where I came from, and then right click on something to go somewhere initializes the display that's the e-paper display and then it's got this loop that runs forever here and it, this loop is um, currently if i go seconds per lap it's uh, 30 seconds so every 30 seconds um, it's going to check to see if anything's changed and every 15 minutes it's going to update the e-paper so um, i could make that longer if i want the e-paper to live longer but i don't really care right now 
Um, so within 15 minutes, you know, you can, you can get this thing updated. Um, yeah. Anyhow, um, what's this loop doing? Takes the time. Um, on the first lap, it's going to re refresh the e-paper just so that something, you know, like I said, you have some default values on there. Um, and then from, th from then on, it's going to be every 15 minutes. Um, the old state of the lights. The reason we do that is if it's time to refresh or if the light status has changed, we're going to refresh the e-paper so that you immediately see the um, display change when the lights turned on or the lights turned off. Um, get the sunset times. That's this array. Um, and this is converting day of year to an approximate week of year because that's what my sunset times are. I've, I just granularity of changing the time is by weeks. Um, guess the on time and the off time, converts them into from strings into um, into minutes, minutes of the day. So zero to one four four zero, in other words, sixty times twenty four minutes in a day. Are the lights on or off? If they are, you know, set the set the relay to that value. If the status has changed, update the um, the e paper. Or if we've gone past our, you know, fifteen minutes, um, then uh, refresh the e paper. Delay thirty seconds and run around again. And I'd I, I blink the um, the blue on the NeoPixel so that I can see that this loop is alive. If I look in the box, if I look in the back of the box, you know, I can see the um, the, the NeoPixel just to show me it's, you know, it's like a health. Uh, so if I open the box, if it's, if it's not working for some reason, I can see if it's still running around this loop or not, because the blue should flash every 30 seconds. All right. So, um, what else can we look at? Check time. I don't think we've looked at all the check time does is, um, gets the time from real time clock and then, uh, figures out if it's daylight savings time or not here again, and based on the day of the year. And if it is daylight savings adds an hour to it. And all this IO write line, it's updating to the serial um, console as well. And there's a lot of string activity in here. Um, and the other one that's got a lot of string activity is the disp the thing that refreshes the e-paper. So it does a lot of um, manipulation of, of strings here, which should mess around with the heap and the stack. And so it's a real world program. Um, so if there's something wrong with Hopper, um, what we do is we we check the initial heap is and the initial stack or what happened at the last power cycle, what, you know, what the available heap and uh, stack were. And then uh, the current are these. And if the current are not, is not equal to initial, then we'll see another line on the diagnostics below the reset line here. We'll see a diagnostic line that says, you know, we, we're losing, we lost some of the heap or we lost some of the stack, which should never happen. Um, but I have tested it by, you know, putting in a, a, a value here, like, um, uh, like, uh, minus 10 like that. And then it, I, I know that the, um, error message will come up. All right. So I've built this, I've put it on here. I'm going to go plug it in and we'll, I'll see my driveway way lights working in, again this evening. And then I'll report back. Um, if there's ever a version four of this experiment to see if we can create a, a long running version, a long running system. So something under hopper that you can turn on, on, you know, leave your device capturing data in the wilderness, you know, for a year and a half and come back and it's still working. So I really like the idea of reliable computing like it used to be, you know, 30 years ago uh, before the operating systems and libraries became too complex and now they just cruft they just fail eventually they fail eventually it's like oh we need to update this or have you tried turning the power on and off again so or on and off again so let's see if we can uh, have a system for these little devices that is super duper reliable you know the kind of stuff you'd want to put on a spacecraft um yeah anyhow thank you for watching listening to my tirade um and don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more of this stuff and learn more about Hopper.